ESG basically allows people to sort of say, you know, it's kind of like neoliberalism with moral satisfaction draped around it. I think it makes it hard to for people to understand that there's going to be some hard decisions that's going to cost some money. And the people who can pay the most and understand and believe in the science may have to, for the future of the country and their own children, you know, step up. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. So I discovered on the internet a, a pamphlet by this guy called uh, Tariq Fancy, who used to work for BlackRock, in fact, in fact, was a chief investment officer for BlackRock, decided to leave BlackRock and decided actually to come clean, at least in his view, about what ESG investment in BlackRock and in general is about. A provocative new op-ed from BlackRock's former CIO of Sustainable Investing claims, quote, the financial services industry is duping the American public with its pro-environment sustainable investing practices. So Tariq's criticism is focused on some of the mechanisms of ESG investing. And ESG, as you all probably know, stands for environmental, social, and governance. ESG, of course, has become a buzzword on the street as companies face pressures from investors to be more transparent. It's this relatively new idea that we should apply non-financial metrics to gauge the appropriateness of investments. And that by doing this, we can essentially make the world a better place, right? That we can take into account all these factors that are important to us socially. So Luigi and I have had this discussion before that we're, we're, we're a little bit skeptical of ESG, and particularly as I see the Wall Street marketing machine rolling into full gear to convince people to put their money into ESG investing. I wonder, well, is it really doing what, what people say it's going to do? And the recent news that U.S. authorities are investigating Deutsche Bank's um, asset management arm after the firm's former head of sustainability said it was overstating how much it used sustainable investing criteria to manage its assets. I mean, I mean, you could unpack that sentence for hours. What are the sustainable investing criteria? How are they overstating it? Who, 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 why didn't anybody notice? So I think the whole area is, is uh, ripe with, with important um, areas to discuss. I thought it might be interesting to start with a pretty simple question, which is what do you think ESG means to most people? And what do you think it actually means? ESG to most of the world and the public means social impact in some way, shape, or form creating social impact with your dollars or Wall Street, whatever. I think to a subset of investment managers and ESG people who are actually inside the system and know that you have to operate according to fiduciary duty, they have convinced themselves that ESG means higher returns or ideally higher returns and social impact. And the products, because of a lack of any kind of rigor or regulation on what is ESG and what's not and what's the impact product and what's not, has gone in a direction where like everything is being sold as ESG because you know there's a race to the bottom at some at some point if no one is telling you what is really ESG or green or not as an asset manager I mean if you leave them a gray area you know they don't leave money on the table right like they're going to move quickly and start occupying that space and realizing that they could just put a green label on most things with a tiny tweak and do it and so that's led to a, a space where the majority of products being sold as ESG have little to no measurable impact and I would argue they endanger capitalism. Right. I mean, at some point, we have to accept that millennials, over 50 percent of millennials don't believe in capitalism. I th think it's ridiculous when I hear boomers say, oh, they blame it on millennials. It's oh well, they don't you know, they don't get anything or you know, they don't get it. I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it right. Like they're seeing a system that is clearly every year claims it's doing all these great things. ESG assets are increasing what I call sustainable is increasing. Uh, and it's increasing alongside carbon emissions and inequality because the way they've built these things is no link between one or the other, right? It's just marketing to preserve the existing system. That's what I saw on the inside. And I don't know that everyone who's in ESG has really figured that out, but I think, you know, it's sort of, you have to have some sense of how the markets work and investing work. But when you actually come, you know, put it all together, it strikes me that it purports to be positive. And in fact, it's just a dangerous placebo that's slowing the overdue action we need. Let me try to make the opposite argument. Uh, not necessarily, I believe, but I think it's useful to voice the opposite argument. Suppose I'm I'm Larry Fink, and I'm not a political leader. I have a fiduciary duty to maximize the financial return of the assets that I have under management. 
what can I do differently to, to uh, improve the situation? That's a really good question. And the answer is you should be honest, I think, about the limitations of what you can do. So here, if business goes out there and they say the answer to market failure is stakeholder capitalism, I think they do an enormous disservice to the public. When you feed these people these messages, there's a significant difference in terms of how they view the role of the private sector versus the role of government. And what I saw was that instead of us actually looking at you know, the referees to come and fix the game, we were expecting the players to do it. And that's just never going to work because their incentives aren't aligned around that. And so to me, what I think Larry Fink and other business leaders should be doing is being honest about the limitations of what they could do in a system that's built this way. And so what, because what they're instead doing now is they're weaving a narrative that the system's going to fix itself and stakeholder capitalism, ca capitalism is the answer. So you look at it and you say, okay, the business community is with one hand holding off taxes and regulation, right? We know that that's what the incentives are built to do, right? It's, it's much cheaper to market and lobby, you know, market yourself as being wonderful and lobby to keep the system gummed up so you can continue your profit engine. So they're holding off taxes and regulation in one hand. As there's growing social angst that nothing is being done about these problems, people are marching in the streets with Greta on climate, you know, they're, they're marching on racial and, and wealth inequality. Financial firms are actually then turning around and saying, well, why don't we exploit this social angst by selling people a bunch of like green products that in reality, the only difference with them is for the most part is that they have higher fees. Right. I mean, they don't have the vast majority of these impact products that are being sold by Wall Street now are public market products that are just moving around baskets of already traded secondary shares. The millennials buying them and paying more fees almost certainly believe that they are creating some impact that would not have otherwise occurred. Otherwise, why would you buy it and pay more in fees? That's, of course, not what's happening. So, you know, I would look at it and say, look, right now you're delaying what the experts are telling us we need into the resulting void. You're selling a bunch of you know, products that are, I would argue, are misrepresented. And I think the answer is that at some point they have to be honest and say, listen, we have experts on the economic side also, right? It's not just a scientist saying we need to bend down the curve. It's economists telling us how we need to do it. And they're ignoring them because it's inconvenient to their own short-term interests. And my question is, how can you possibly be standing on a stage and doing that under the guise of responsible business? I mean, it strikes me as being arguably the opposite and, you know, really just unfair to your own employees or in their 20s and 30s. Do you think they're being deliberately dishonest or do you think they're lying to themselves too? In other words, is it a convenient fiction that we can create all this change and so we're going to pretend to ourselves too that we're, 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 not, we're not playing a double game? Or do you think people are actually cynical enough to understand what you're saying and be doing it anyway? Uh, it's a really good question. I can't tell you that they know and they're doing it cynically because I, I don't, I can't possibly know that. And what I do think has happened is that they are in a group think. I think in 2021, they have to be disarmed of this nonsensical thesis. And I think the way to really drive that is number one, point out that there's no impact of any of this, right? Which is what I saw. Number two, point out that it's becoming a dangerous placebo that's slowing the reforms that we need from government. And number three, and this is arguably the most important, is to point out to them that they can't have it both ways, right? They can't argue that it's you know, we need government action to bend down the COVID curve, but we don't need government action to bend down the climate curve. When in both cases, the experts are telling us we do, right? Here's the kind of fascinating thing. If you look at climate change, with COVID-19, there are, there's a science consensus, right? There's virologists and there's infectious disease experts are saying, here's how it spreads, right? Through aerosols and so on. Now look at that same dichotomy on climate change. The scientists are telling us we're creating this, right? This is, this is caused by humans. And they're saying we need to bend down the curve. All the business leaders are saying we agree with that, but they're not agreeing with the second part which is the economists like William Nordhaus, who you know won the Nobel Prize in economics three years ago for something he's been saying for decades. I mean, there's a very clear consensus that you need a price on carbon. And there's a clear consensus that you need a set of other reforms that are obviously driven by government because a market failure is not going to self-correct itself. And that second part is the one they're not listening to. I think the COVID-19 bit is an important point, and that's why I wanted to spark a debate in the wake of of the pandemic, because before memories fade, we have to look back on the fact that we can't treat a slow moving crisis as you know someone else's problem and a fast moving one as one where suddenly we need government action and not acknowledge that that has to do something with the fact that the interests of the people promoting that argument are all skewed towards the short term. You're making it a little bit too simple. Number one, Emmanuel Macron tried to pass a carbon tax and he had a gilet jaune invading the squares in Paris for weeks and weeks, and they took COVID basically to defeat them because otherwise it was still there protesting. So politically, and we're not talking about Total or some uh, big oil company blocking that. We're talking about literally the man on the street fighting against it. So the, the political economy 
of the carbon tax is not that straightforward as you make it to be, number one. Number two, even in COVID, the experts will greatly differ on how to tackle it. There are still people that uh, would like to go to a zero COVID world in which we are like New Zealand and every time there is one case, you shut down the country for uh, six months. Other people say, you know, we need to live to live with it and accept some level. So there is not a universal consensus on, on what to do in COVID, let alone in, in climate change. So both of those points are correct. And yet both of those, I would argue, are easily addressed. So the first point is around the idea that there's no political consensus. It's very difficult for a politician to do it because people don't want it. You're right about that, right? I mean, right now, if they tried to do that in the US, people would you know, be out in the streets or a lot of people would be out in the streets. But that just reaffirms the point. I mean, if it were true that every single business leader was out there saying to the public, listen, we can't solve this problem. You know, let them pass a carbon tax. That's what our experts are saying. And then people are out in the streets saying we don't want to do it. Then we could have this conversation about it. But right now, if every single business leader is out there, frankly, they can't turn around and say, well, you know, don't look at us. Macron can't get the carbon tax price because I turn to them and say, listen, in the world we live in today, you have outsized influence, particularly after Citizens United right, to be able to influence the system, you probably hold more of the cards than the politicians do because A, they're short, super short term oriented, right? Just like the business leaders. But the difference is they're begging for money and the business leaders have the money. So at least the business leaders, you can implore them on some sense of like being responsible and doing the right thing and say, listen, you need to go and tell the public also. Like, cause if you're going out there and saying, I can solve this problem, stakeholder capitalism is the answer. You can't turn around and say, well, the public doesn't want government action because you've effectively conditioned them to say that. The second point on COVID-19, I don't disagree at all. There's absolutely no consensus on the level of government action that you need. But what there is a consensus on is the fact that you need some government action, right? So imagine we're, let me give you an example. Imagine we're driving from Boston to New York and halfway through the driver is a guy called Donald Trump and he doesn't know how to drive the car, right? And, you know, people could say, I've heard people say, oh, how can you expect the government to? I say, listen, separate the driver from the vehicle, right? If we stop the car two hours in, because he's not driving very well, the answer isn't that we should drop the car and walk the rest of the way. The answer is you switch driver because we have to accept that this is the vehicle we need. Well, government is the vehicle that we need. I think it's a fair point. One of the things Luigi and I have talked about in this podcast before is that in a sense, a free market is an illusion anyway, because everything has rules. There are rules that mm -hmm. govern the foundations of a free market. If you think about it in the United States, bankruptcy rules, there are always rules that are set by government. The idea that it's just a free for all is not is, is not actually true. And I also think it's a fair point that that these that these sort of state ideas of stakeholder capitalism and ESG are providing fig leaves that make us think we're doing something when 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 we actually aren't. Um, but I do worry that you're giving the deep deeply divided American public um, a little too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> and in, yeah. in, in the sense that, uh, that that being able to see this on rationally might then spark some sort of agreement. Um, and I worry that if you want the leadership to come from America, and that requires the agreement or even majority of the American public, that I think we might be in trouble. I, I don't disagree. There's so many other pieces to that challenge also with respect to pol you know, political polarization that gets you talking about the media and then you know even worse tech. There's no question that um, it is very difficult. But I do think that you know, I'm not convinced that red states and Trump voting places would not be OK doing something about climate change. I think that you need to set up the deal correctly. And I think if you think about it as saying, well, we're going to need to spend a lot of money and build a lot of new things. Let's put that production in the areas where, frankly, people don't believe in climate change and have been eviscerated by trade and automation in recent decades. You might find that actually you build a political foundation to do it because I'm, I have no doubt that they'll say, oh, I don't believe in climate change. And you say, how about we build a factory to employ 10,000 people building solar? Power? Yes, I believe in climate change. Let's do it. You know what I mean? Like it's there. If you make them the, the right deal to do it, that'll work. But there's a challenge. The challenge is that if that's the deal that happens, who's going to pay for it? It's clearly going to be the, uh, you know, the rich latte sipping liberals on the coasts. Right. But, you know, people on the coast who are sort of the, the liberals who want to fight climate change, they're probably going to have to pay more for it. That I think that until that acceptance comes, which I don't think comes if you have ESG, because ESG basically allows people to sort of say, you know, it's kind of like neoliberalism with moral satisfaction draped around it. I think it makes it hard to for people to understand that there's going to be some hard decisions. It's going to cost some money. And the people who can pay the most and understand and believe in the science may have to for the future of the country and their own children you know, step up, right, and, 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 and do what they need to do to make it happen. So when I asked you about uh, what Larry Fink could do, I was surprised that your answer was not, he can actually vote 
all the shares he has in one particular direction. As you write in your essay, he, BlackRock owns at least 5% in basically most of the companies that matter in the planet, and not just in the United States. If BlackRock were to vote systematically at shareholders meeting in favor of sort of environmental propositions and uh, replacing directors in favor of more environmentally concerned directors, it could make a difference. Uh, we saw what happened even with Exxon when Engine One made a proposal and was able to a qualify plurality and get a, a representation on the board. So we are missing a big opportunity here. Yeah, I mean, so I'm glad you brought up Exxon Mobil and Engine One because I think it's largely a distraction from what needs to be done. And I'll explain to you why. So he, I'll give you an example. When I was at BlackRock, I had to help advise on certain share voting, right? And I, I don't think Larry's doing the wrong thing on that. I think that they're voting the shares exactly as they should be because they're a fiduciary, right? They have to focus on shareholder return. I'll give examples like some kind of beverage company or something. And there was a proposal that they should spend a lot of money to make their packaging, you know, recyclable, right? And more environmentally friendly. Fine. Of course, it costs a lot of money to do that. So I'm sitting there trying to advise on these shares. And I'm, I, have, I have to wear two hats. What is good for the world? Clearly, they spend this money and they start doing responsible packaging. What am I supposed to say as a fiduciary? Well, if there's no one penalizing them for the cost of that garbage that they're dumping on the world, as a fiduciary, you don't do what's good for the planet. You do what's good for shareholder returns. Even Larry can't justify voting. Like, how can he vote in favor of all these kinds of regulations to do the right thing for the environment unless someone is going to internalize that externality? Like, you can't do it because it's good for the world. Right. So this brings me to the challenge of engine number one and Exxon Mobil. It's one of these things where I think like you get on the board. Good news. Now you're a fiduciary to shareholders of an oil company. I don't need to do the math to figure out that the oil company's best profit is to keep extracting fossil fuels and certainly far more than we need, we need for it to happen as a society. Right. Like it's clear that that's obvious. So like maybe they believe a bit more in renewable power. But the favor we could do Exxon Mobil's directors to get them to actually reduce their emissions footprint over time would be to put a price on carbon in, right? Because then you've actually made it less profitable to do fossil fuels, and they may actually start to direct and invest more in renewables. Exxon Mobil versus Engine One seems to have become another placebo, where it actually, I would argue, is lowering the impetus for a carbon tax because we're being fooled into believing that the good, you know, the answer is putting people on different people on the board of an oil company where they have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. And you have to stop and think. It's like how can the answer be a good hedge fund to fight the bad ones? Like if you think of the amount of press that happened around that, it's not like use the sports analogy. It's kind of like you're, everyone's on the field and they're trying to find every solution possible. That's not, let's get the damn refs in here to do their job. Like imagine how we were playing soccer and I, I, I'm kicking players and then I'm going and scoring a goal because it's definitely easier to beat defenders if I can you know, kick them and run past them. I mean, some parts, some, someone's got to come in and give a red card. And frankly, there is an unacknowledged amount of privilege in the people making this debate. Look, everybody in finance talks their book, to be honest. They talk their book. They're going to do what's in their interest. You know, everyone in the, in, the, in the investment management space for sure does that. Fine. If you took one of these people who are arguing that Exxon Mobil versus Engine One, that's the way forward and they're joining the board, I'd say, oh, okay, great. That's okay. I see what your book is. Let me see what your incentives are. Let me see your fund. Are you fundraising? What are your fees? Okay, great. I just changed everything. Your book is no longer that. You don't run a private equity firm. Now you're an eight-year-old girl in Bangladesh. You think they're gonna? You think they're gonna prescribe the same solution? Zero percent chance. I would argue there's zero percent chance that they they would suddenly look and they'd say, "Oh my God, we need a carbon tax." Yes, this is not gonna work, right? There's a there's a think of they understand finance, right? Everyone's acting like we're all in it together. Well, Larry's risk tolerance and the eight-year-old girl in Bangladesh's risk tolerance are not the same. He has a very high risk tolerance because he gains from the current system and is not at risk of the consequences of inaction. The eight-year-old girl in Bangladesh, you just, you, we don't need to look at her book. She has no carbon footprint and she doesn't gain from the status quo and it's going to bear the consequences of inaction. I think I think you have a point. Uh, we talked to Chris James for this podcast and pushed him on that and he was very clear that in the end his goal was fiduciary duty and was making money and that he was going to do whatever. And I also, I was thinking as you were talking that I think there might be a deeper problem here, which is underneath the Larry Fink's of the world is the hypocrisy of the investing public. Even if fiduciary rules were reformed, if all of a sudden you did have the Larry Fink's of the world 
world choosing to lose a billion dollars because it was good for the world and we had to say, oh, this ESG stuff actually doesn't produce great returns. You would make a lot more money by doing things that weren't ESG. I wonder if a lot of the allure goes away. In other words, it's a lot easier to believe in the allure when you also appear to be making a lot of money than it is to actually be making that choice to not make money because something because something is better for the world. But I wanted to get to something else, which I, I was wondering about. Is the heart of your critique essentially that, that buying ex- shares of existing companies does nothing because that's not the, the, that's not the funding funding metric, and so essentially that this public market ESG approach is ineffective, or is your argument that the metrics are simply insufficient? In other words, would you distinguish between public market ESG investing and venture capital um, green green investing? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. What is good about the ESG space and what's bad about the ESG space? Because I'm not saying we should just throw the whole thing out. A lot of people say it's all out the baby with the bathwater. I'm not saying that. What is good about the ESG space are three things: the people. Right, I think that there's a lot of human capital that's been brought in to industries that would need to exist where people who are passionate about sustainability and they care about it and they want to make a difference. Right, The tools, by which I mean increase the issue data and disclosure, and the standards are useful. Right, I mean, we need to be able to measure these things over time. And I absolutely do think businesses should focus on stakeholders. Right, I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do. I just don't think we can rely on that to solve systemic crises. And that's where ESG becomes damaging. Uh, A private, let's say a private VC, like a climate tech type of fund can argue they're an impact product that absolutely adds value. And if there were more of those, you know, it'd be great if all of us invest in them because they can at least make the argument that they're providing primary funding to innovators that otherwise would not have had access to that capital, would not have built, you know, some carbon capture and storage or renewable power thing that we need. The problem is that with no rigor around the industry, ESG means all things to all people. And so you have a subset that's really a small minority of funds like that that are getting lumped in with you know a bunch of big public markets vehicles and, and frankly, ETFs. ETFs have faced fee compression for years, right? It's just a volume game. And so as you go more and more into these liquid products and the public markets, ones that are under fee pressure, they are the ones that can they cannot show there's any real impact. They also are under under significant fee compression and have a particular incentive to go out and paint themselves as green and absent any kind of rules around doing it, you know, it, the, you know, the, the people will keep moving in that direction because again, they don't leave money on the table. So let me try to decompose a bit uh, the various uh, pieces of your argument. So the first one, you say carbon pricing would be the right solution. I think that every economist will agree on that. The second is that uh, there's a lot of posturing in the industry and we call it posturing, not to call it fraud, but uh, we agree. Then you thought that divestment is not the right solution because, of course, there is a very high elasticity of demand for stock. So you're not going to impact things. And and you differentiate between a boycott where losing 10 percent of your customers can have an impact. Well, uh, if you lose 10 percent of your most liberal shareholders, you can get 10 percent of the most uh, uh, conservative or and they substitute not only the substitute, they get actually a higher return for substituting. So you actually subsidize uh, the other side. So far, I follow you. But uh, then you make, uh, or at least I think you make, but feel free to disagree, one last step that is somehow a theory of change that you're not uh, at least putting forward or I did not see you put forward, that basically so much worse, so much better. It, it reminds me a bit of uh, the old fashioned Marxists that were saying, oh, we need to, we cannot actually improve the condition of the workers because we want uh, capitalists to fail. And anything you do to improve the condition of the workers will delay the eventual uh, failure of capitalism. And so we should actually sit on the sideline, let the system collapse because uh, uh, so much worse, so much better. And uh, and that's the part I, I, I'm not following you because I agree with you that voting or engine one are not representing the first best solution. I agree with you that if I care about uh, my shareholders, I choose a level of extraction of oil, which is certainly superior to what is optimal from a societal point of view. However, it's also possible that Exxon is so much on the other side of the spectrum that at least uh, what they're doing is something in the right direction. So is it possible that you run uh, a company, now you run a company that is known for profit, but uh, imagine that you were to run the company for profit. I think that you probably will not run to maximize profits. You run to maximize your utility, which is a combination of how much you get of profit of the company plus some other stuff. And so my claim is if you are Larry Fink and you represent the Tariq of this world, why do you have to only look at profits? Why can't you take into consideration 
other aspects. After all, in Europe, uh, the fiduciary duty is defined in a different way and of course varies by country. But if you are a pensioner in California, is really my fiduciary duty to maximize profits and make sure that you cannot live in California anymore because it's, it's on fire? Or should I put a weight also on uh, climate change? And, and I grant you that this is below what is optimal for the society point of view, but it's better than zero. You know, the better the zero argument is one that I think I always hear and I, and I wonder to myself, because it's sort of like, always anecdotal, not statistical. It's the old trick of like, you know, you know, sort of exploiting the availability bias, I guess maybe, or, or something similar where you're sort of just feeding people stories. I mean, of course, there's been progress made in the last 10 years, right? It would be impossible for us not to have more renewable power and more electric vehicles than 10 years ago, unless we were insane, right? The concern I have is the speed of that progress, right? It's not sufficient. It's clearly not sufficient. Unlike the Marx example, there's, we have a scientific consensus and there's a bunch of numbers and graphs and we know what we need to do. I mean, of course, there's gray areas a lot within that, but we certainly know directionally, I think, without any question that the progress we're making is far too slow. Is engine number one versus Exxon and a whole set of other ideas based on the free market, are they helping us or hurting us? You might argue that they're helping us because you're saying, well, we need to make X amount of progress every year. These guys are making, you know, 0 0.2 or 3X, but hey, it's better than zero. And I would argue that that's insufficient because we know we need to make a lot more progress and we know exactly how to do that. And the consensus for doing that is being undermined by the entire thesis and all the actions that surround the 0 0.2 or 0 0.3X. It's like saying we're playing the Sunday soccer league and we're, you and I are playing at the park on Sunday and there's no referees anywhere and that's not an option because Sunday afternoon just a few of us kicking around the ball. Then I would argue in favor of incremental Things, I'd say bring out those things because we don't have an alternative. But when we have an alternative and when we have an expert consensus on it, it doesn't make sense to me that we would spend our time on a set of solutions that clearly are inadequate. I wanted to, I think we're going to run out of time, Sim, and I wanted to close on a question, which is you could have stayed inside this system yourself. What was it? What was your moment in time that made you say you were instead going to go from being one of the ultimate insiders to being an outsider and, and tackle this in a way that was bound to make you enemies? Um, I'm not, I'm not worried about making enemies, frankly. You know, I, I think it's more important to speak truth to power. I would, I would make my own self and I'd be an enemy of my own self and be very unhappy if I didn't speak out on an issue like this. And I feel very strongly about, I had come to the conclusion there wasn't much impact out of this. What made me, so, and, but I wasn't going to, you know, try to start a, a debate and, and potentially throw egg in the faces of people I used to work with, because on a personal level, I know a ton of people there. I got along with them. They're great. I'm still in touch with them. You know, uh, but if they're going to go on stage and talk about social purpose and, you know, fighting climate change and this, that and the other, I mean, these are important social imperatives that has to be subject to an open and honest debate in a democracy. And if they have a good answer um, and if there's a great answer on the other side, that's great. Right. That's why, Luigi, I, I really appreciate. I, I, I don't know. I suspect that you're playing a devil's advocate role in, in, in a very effective way, I would add, um, because these are questions that need to be debated. I don't think they've been debated yet. Right. I haven't really seen a response coming out of the titans of business who have put their names on the business roundtable statement or really anyone on that. And I wouldn't tell them they have to sit back and accept and, you know, just say, OK, government's the answer. It may be hard to get done politically. And they're going to say that, oh, how do we get it done? The system gummed up. Therefore, you know, we are the solution with our green products. But you really can't make that argument if you're not being a clear with the public about the fact that you have limitations on what you could do the way the system is structured. And number two, if you're also half the time like supporting those same politicians, right? It's not like they're saying a blanket ban on, you know, we're going to use our lobbying efforts to push for climate legislation because that's what we know the experts are saying to do. And by the way, we're going to also stop supporting any politician who denies climate change. Like I haven't seen them saying that. And if they say that, then I think they would have at least done what I would say is, is responsible business. You know, even if it hurts a little bit of near-term shareholder value across the economy, over the long term, it is in the public interest and, frankly, long-term financial returns for us to deal with these problems sooner than later. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think we're out of time, but we really enjoyed the debate and discussion. And best of luck to you. So did I. This is this is one of the this is a really good one. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it brought up some really interesting issues. So uh, thank you guys for taking the time. So 
So did something surprise you, Luigi? Actually, half of it surprised me, half of it did not. So the part that did not surprise me, but I think was useful to hear from an expert who leave the, the industry, is uh, how much money is made there without much of a substance. And um, I'm actually feel uh, very much uh, vindicated the fact that he agrees with the point that I and others have made that divestment does not really make a difference uh, because uh, the substitution is so easy that saves your soul but not uh, the planet. Will you pause uh, on that for a little bit to explain why that's true, why you think that divestment doesn't make that much of a difference? Tariq makes this point in his diary very effectively and say he, he wants to distinguish between divestment and boycotting is much easier to replace 10% of your shareholders than is to replace 10% of your customers. Shareholders are just in, in search for returns. So if I lose 10% of shareholders and my stock becomes a bit more appealing, I have a lot of other people who buy more of it. On the other hand, if 10% uh, of people buying furs stop buying furs, it's not that the others are going to substitute and buy twice as many furs or three times as many furs. Uh, boycotting of furs is much more effective than boycotting the stock of uh, fur companies if you want to stop uh, animal killing. And I know I touch a sensitive topic to you, uh, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, I want to get I want to get back to what did surprise you, but but isn't I wanted to pause on this point for a minute because isn't there a tipping point with this? If everybody divests because they have to care about ESG metrics, then doesn't the idea that there's always another willing shareholder who only cares about how profitable the firm is to come in behind the one who has decided to divest because of lack of ESG metrics? Uh, doesn't that change at some point? And isn't that part of the argument of ESG people, that if you make this a broadly applied criteria across the board and you reach a tipping point with it, then it still may be harder to find more customers, but it becomes less and less easy to find other shareholders? No, it's definitely true. The question is how much of this you should control and how much of an impact you have and at what cost. In fact, in a paper with the two co-authors, I'm trying to assess how big that should be. And, and it's, it's quite large. It's very hard to have an impact unless uh, that, that mass is, is, is massive. And one, one of the things we find is always less than proportional. So in, if it, like 30% of investors don't buy, you're going to have much less than 30% of the impact that you expect. And, and that is precisely because of this uh, substitutability. And Look at another way, if we all divest from Exxon, the Koch brothers will buy in Exxon and we actually do them a service because the price of Exxon is going to be low and they make money. We enable them to get even richer. Oh my goodness. So that's an <laughs> yeah. interesting way so to make I think that, uh, <laughs> um, uh, It's different when you talk about large loans. Unfortunately, the market for loans, especially large syndicated loans, is relatively concentrated. Whenever a market is concentrated, then the power of, if you want, boycotting or, or divesting might be more uh, influential because, uh, but it's more boycotting than if you can uh, convince, for example, banks not to lend to large uh, infrastructural projects in uh, oil and gas. Then uh, when it comes to projects of billions and billions of dollars, the number of banks in the world willing to do that is probably in, the, in, in two hands. In the, in I wonder, though, it would actually be an interesting thing to look into if the rise of CLOs, if the rise of the leveraged loan market and of CLOs and the ability to take these loans and chop them up into thousands and thousands of pieces that are sold to other investors, if that starts to make it less effective as a means of not lending, because you've broadened the investor base so much beyond those original banks that, that, that anyways, it's a little bit but, off. Sorry, but they are still organized by the They're banks. They're still organized by the banks, but they are now, because, of the, because they are often packaged and sold in the same way mortgages are, you've broadened the investor base for those loans. And in a super low yield world like we're in today, you have no shortage of takers for particularly anything slightly risky that might carry a higher yield. So I wonder if that argument has changed a little bit today with the broadening of the investor base for these type of loans. But whatever, that's a little bit beside our, our topic. Just might be interesting. No, it's an interesting question. Um, so what? let's go back to what it is that did surprise you. If this is what didn't surprise you, what did? It's how st strongly minded it was that this is necessarily in every form a bad thing to do. Take the case of Chris James. He was very clear saying that he sees that as a net negative based on the idea that this necessarily is a substitute to other activities. 
I think I, I stick to my analogy of the old Marxists that were waiting for the revolution, that they wanted uh, things to get worse so that they would get better soon. I, th I still disagree with you on that. I actually think his diagnosis was was pretty compelling. I remember when the Business Roundtable came out with a statement whenever it was a couple of years ago. I'm in COVID time now, and I have no idea when things happened pre-COVID, but I think it was a couple of years ago when they came yeah, out. Yeah, it was with August uh, 2019. <laughs> Thank you for having a better mind than I have, or at least a better memory. <laughs> um, anyway, but when they came out with that, that statement, I thought, well, this holds them to nothing and does nothing, and it's a way of making them sound good and palatable to millennials. Uh, millennials Millennials in their workforce, millennial investors, but it actually doesn't, it doesn't necessarily accomplish anything. And I think allowing people to think that they're accomplishing something when they're in reality accompli accomplishing nothing um, other than accumulating assets that will help make the banks rich. I, I think that might be worse than nothing, and so I don't I don't agree that it's a, that 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 it's a little bit better than than nothing. Where I got sort of concerned. Um, uh, so, sorry, can can I stop you there? Yes. So. First of all, I am 100% with you vis-a-vis -vis the business roundtable. In fact, I remember the time because I remember when I was, when I, I read that and I wrote a piece for the Washington Post. See, good memory. Exactly. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the associative memory. Saying exactly the, the, those things. But maybe because I see through this, I don't see this as uh, so necessarily devastating. I don't fall for the marketing, so I don't see as sort of a so so negative. What I was taken back is seeing that even the improvement that Chris Jane was trying to bring to Exxon, that was negative. He said that even that was negative. That's where I found it more difficult to follow. You're him. right. You're right. That's fair. And that is a parsing of what he was saying and a parsing of what's actually happening out there that I think is right. And he might be underestimating people's intelligence in the sense that there might be a lot more people out there who see through it. Um, although then again, based on the incredibly rapid accumulation of assets in ESG uh, in ESG funds, I'm, I'm not sure that many people do, do see through it. But, um, but I think he might also be overestimating people's willingness to put their money into real change if there isn't a return there. In other words, I, I'm not sure if you tell people that instead of making a 20% return on their ESG investment because it's a win-win and you can win by doing good, that if you tell them, well, actually, you're going to give your money to us, but you're going to lose 10% a year when the market's going up 10% a year because we're going to choose to do things with your, your, your money. I don't know how many people would actually make that choice. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical of people's willingness uh, Bethany, to do good that, that's not uh, That's not a trick. Off. I don't think that uh, anybody wants to lose 10%. I think that the idea is, are you willing to have a slightly lower return? And, and the question is, how much are you willing to give up? So I am 100% with you that funds should be more transparent and say, look, we are paying a price for it. And, and maybe in the short term, we don't because we're part of a trend, blah, blah, blah. But we are such a committed capital that we are willing to pay a price, not a 20% price like the one you described, but... Uh, well, but, I'm, exa uh, I'm exaggerating it to make a point. Uh, of course, but, of but, course. But, but, so I, I, but I, I stand by my point. I don't think many people would give up that much. They might give up one or two percentage points a year. I'd be surprised if people were willing to give up 5%. Uh, 5%, especially these days, is a lot. But willing to give up 1% a year is gigantic. The only evidence I know is uh, some evidence that they ask Dutch pensioners whether they were willing to give up some in order to improve. And the overwhelming majority said yes. Yeah, but they're, so, but they're I, better people than we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it is a fact that in Europe, there is much more sensitivity on this than, than the United States. And, and I think in part of it is because Europe is much smaller, so we don't have the luxury of space. In the United States, there's so much space that you think is infinite. In Europe, you cannot have that illusion, especially in the Netherlands, where you're about to go under anyway. Well, that's a broader, that's a broader interesting point. I wonder, I think Americans do believe in the infinite, right? And maybe it's just because of, of, of our geography and the sense of the infinite and the oceans on both sides and the Great Lakes, that there is this sense of expansiveness and infinite that we don't believe we should have to be reined in. Whereas if you live in a more circumscribed geography, um, perhaps you're more willing to to accept that there are that there are limits. Anyway, sort of sort of interesting. You know, the thing that actually though there there were two points he didn't make that I thought think are interesting on the subject of ESG, and I'm not 
criticizing him for not making them. But then I, I actually got quite worried about his execution or his desired execution. The points he didn't make were, were are people lying? Like, how real are the sustainable investing criteria? What, what actually are these criteria? Do they, do they matter? And then even are green things really green? I mean, when you think about the environmental damage done by solar panels, or when you think about the human rights violations that are increasingly being caused by rare earth mining needed to make many of our green, our, our green equipment. And I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but to me, that's a whole fascinating area, which is how green is, 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 is really green. The part, I guess I'm still enough of a child of the 80s or skeptical enough of the idea of big, big government, that the idea that the government should forcibly impose climate change policies. I was joking with a friend recently that I have this, I would write a dystopian novel coming out of COVID, that people are going to say, well, we shut down the world exactly as Tariq did. We shut down the world in order to stop, save COVID. Climate change is a bigger is a bigger issue. Why don't we shut down the world in order to stop climate change and, and save humanity? And he's right. It's a very easy step from one to the other. But to me, that's not an easy step that we should make. That's an easy step that makes me say, oh, whoa. Because then what happens? I mean, do you want the government deciding, rationing whether you get to travel or not? Or turning, you know, handing out vouchers for who gets to get on a plane or who gets to use an automobile in order to go see their family? And I know I'm, I'm overstating it, but putting putting governments in charge of changing people's behavior um, in the name of preventing climate change can be taken to a pretty a pretty scary extreme. But actually, to to his credit, he was proposing a carbon tax, which is not necessarily big government. In fact, it might be a better way to raise uh, uh, taxes than the income tax. So, I wasn't clear if that was all he was proposing. If that's all he was, if it stops at a carbon tax, okay. But you see my point. What I am, am fascinated is by the fact that he has in his mind a view of political consequence of actions and say, if you do this, the political consequence will be negative. He's not factoring the political consequences of his own action. Now, I might be a little bit conspiratorial here, but the degree of attention that uh, his pamphlet received is quite impressive, right? Because it was quoted, I think, by The Economist, by this, by that. And so whenever something comes out of the blue and receives so much attention, I use the old-fashioned uh, Latin census, cui protest, who benefits from it. Because generally, this kind of public free publicity is done to somebody that plays a positive role in the interest of somebody. I think that what he's doing is like a fantastic service to people like Exxon, who are terrified. You know that Chevron went and talked to Chris James in advance because he was afraid that Chris James will play the same trick with uh, Chevron. So big oil companies are, sorry my French expression, peeing their pants about what is going to happen. And uh, this uh, uh, diary of Tariq Fancy is uh, music to their ear because is useless, in fact, is counterproductive, we should go back to the old world and wait for uh, Big Brother to place the role. Now, that is a conspiracy theory that had not occurred to even my conspiratorial brain. So that's that's impressive. I'm not sure whether your conspiracy theory or my dystopian fantasy of governments handing out passes to allow us to drive our cars is, is more believable. Actually, I'm going to go with yours. <laughs> I doubt I doubt that it's I doubt that it's deliberate on his part, but I, I would very much doubt that it's deliberate on his part, but you're right that you can certainly see it as serving the interests of big companies that don't want to have to change by saying, oh, well, 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 we don't have to do anything at all. Make the, make the government do it. And I do. So, so, sorry, sorry. I'm not saying it's deliberate on his part. I'm saying that he, if he's so concerned about the political consequences of what you're doing, he should be the first one to realize the political consequences of what he's doing. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I understand that point. If you were to take his point of view to a logical extreme, you'd say companies just stop pretending at all and just go back to the to the old world of what whatever makes money. And that does bring us back where we started to your to your point. Maybe then that is actually worse than allowing the status quo to continue. I guess I'd say I guess I'd say they both have costs and I'm, I'm not sure which costs are worse. I agree on that. Have you ever wondered what goes on inside a black hole? 
or why time only moves in one direction, or what is really so weird about quantum mechanics. Well, then you should listen to Why This Universe. On this podcast, you'll hear about the strangest and most interesting ideas in physics, broken down by physicists Dan Hooper and Shalma Wegsman. If you want to learn about our universe, from the quantum to the cosmic, you won't want to miss Why This Universe, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. The other thing that surprised me is that he didn't push more for Larry Fink and other big investors to vote the shares they control. That is potentially a big, big thing that will change the world. I hear his argument that the concept of fiduciary duty doesn't actually allow you to do that. I don't know if that's true. And I don't know if there is then, if then the issue is we should redefine what fiduciary duty is. And that fiduciary duty isn't only doing the thing that's going to make the most money. Maybe fiduciary duty encompasses some leeway for doing something that you think is, is right for the world. But I, but I, I heard his argument on fiduciary duty, the threats of lawsuits and the legal system coming down on top of you. For that is, it's. I think it's real. I agree, but what is funny is that this is exactly the position position of Larry Fink. So he is so revolutionary on one end, but so conservative and traditional on the other. Many years ago, I chair a panel in the periphery of Davos. You know, in Davos there are the people who are insiders and the people on the outside. I I've was always an outsider. Been, I've always been such an outsider <laughs> that I've never been invited. So yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but the, the people in the, in the periphery are indeed the people who are not invited who run things on the side. So I was in the in a, an outsider running a panel uh, and Larry Fink participated in the panel. We were in a discussion very similar to this and he cited the fiduciary duty. And I said, look, you control at the time was what, $8 trillion in assets. If you want the Department of Labor to change the standard, you can have it done tomorrow. So don't tell me that uh, you are bound by a fiduciary duty rule that is a rule of the Department of Labor because you can change it tomorrow if you want to. What did he say in response to that? I'm not sure that's true. Was very frustrated, which I think is true. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, but this is very self-serving, I think he has not read properly Hart and Zingales, where if he read that, he will understand that you can have a a broader fiduciary duty because your goal is to maximize the welfare of your investors, not necessarily the uh, return, the financial returns. Yeah. So we decided to discuss this today's capital is or capital isn't the expiration of extra employment benefits. In Money Watch, federal unemployment benefits are expiring for millions of Americans. I think the original enactment of the extra employment insurance was absolutely a capital is. It's appropriate for the government. That's what a government should do. Whether it should expire or not, you know, I'm <laughs> I, I'm a little torn. Listen, for those millions of Americans, this is going to be a big shock to the system. However, there are over 10 million open jobs, meaning jobs available in this country, and that number is only going up. On the one hand, I would like to see the labor markets change in a way that is responsive to people's options. Part of inequality has been far too many people trapped in really low paying menial jobs. People now have the opportunity to say, no, I'm not going to take that job unless you pay me more. That in some ways seems like a positive. I'd be willing to pay a little bit more for my latte to have a, a better society. On the other hand, I have talked to so many people from restaurateurs, small business owners who literally can't find workers. It's funny that Andrew Yang in his presidential campaign was saying that we we're all going to be unemployed and we need to have a universal basic income in order to make up for it. And it seems the other way around. Matt shaking I, his head. <laughs> it's creative destruction, right? Maybe there shouldn't be that many restaurant jobs in the market because they're terrible and don't lead to the creation of much of anything other than getting to eat four different types of sandwiches instead of two different types of sandwiches. I, I for sure am... I for sure am sympathetic to the arguments that a lot of these jobs either shouldn't exist or need to pay people a lot a lot more money and that something had gone fundamentally wrong in our labor markets, whether it's a question of oversupply or whether it's a question of lack of unions that have forced this this enormous divide. So I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to that point of view. I just don't know how I feel about anything approaching a universal basic income um, because of the dystopian possibilities of it. The, the other thing that is not trivial is where do you set the level? 
because there is no doubt that a minimum wage set at the proper level will actually push innovation, precisely because if you cannot pay people, you need other way more productive to, to do things. When I was in the Italian army, there was still a mandatory conscription, I spent a day of my life carrying sheets from the floor to the ground floor to the third floor because there was no elevator and uh, we were cheaper than the elevator so the army were not paying for the elevator because they had uh, free labor uh, to bring up so i think that having a cost a minimum cost will push for innovation is good however how do you determine whether you are pushing too high and you have a lot of people uh, that uh, cannot work because they cannot produce a level of wage in the scandinavian countries they did this quite well until they started to open up for immigration. Why? Because they were investing heavily in education. They were very, uh, all the characteristics. So all the workers were highly productive. And so they could maintain a very high minimum wage and a very low level of unemployment. And that was fiscally consistent and so on and so forth. The moment they had massive immigration, then the, the productivity uh, was much lower. And so they had two choices, either to give up the minimum wage, or at least at that level, or uh, bear a very high level of unemployment with all the consequences, social and fiscal, that this comes in. So I think that uh, it is in some form a good idea. Whether we can implement in that form remains to be seen. Whether this particular form is the right form, I have doubts. So I would sum it up by saying that the enactment of the original extra unemployment insurance was for sure a capital is. That's exactly what the system should do in a time of crisis. Its continuation now, I think, is a capital isn't, because I think if we're going to have a fundamental discussion about welfare reform and universal basic income, then let's have that discussion to the extent our country and our politicians are capable of actually having it. And let's enact a plan and not just continue to blindly throw money at something. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.